Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. I hope uh, those of you who celebrated had an amazing Christmas. Hope those of you enjoying Boxing Day today are having a great one as well. We've got family coming over later on my side of the family. Uh, so our Christmas festivities continue. Got a little bit of time here. I wanted to make a video for you. As promised, we're going to take a look at the second episode of Extra History's uh, two-part uh, video series on the Christmas truce of 1914 during the Great War. Uh, and this is about letters from the trenches. Now, I love letters written by soldiers on the front lines because I think they give us a very unique uh, look at history on the ground as it's happening. Uh, and one of the things that I'm really keying in on as I prepare uh, for my trip to France, which is now about a month away, keeping fingers crossed that nothing changes from the current COVID rules over there or here. Uh, so that I can do that. One of the things I'm really looking at is I want to find those individual stories on both sides, German, French, uh, English, American, um, those individual stories to get a unique perspective on things that were happening in places like Verdun and the Somme and Bellow Wood. And so I love these letters. Uh, now, as I always mention, when we're talking about historical sources, it's important to keep in mind who's writing, why they're writing, what their biases might be, what their motivations might be. Uh, but letters from the trenches are about as close to the real thing as we can get. Um, they're not revisionist historians telling the story 50 or 100 years later. These are people on the ground, but obviously you have to consider why are they writing? Well, they're, if they're writing home, they're probably writing to connect with family. They're probably gonna be motivated by wanting to reassure their families that they're doing okay, but also to reach out and say, hey, would love to hear from you. Uh, you know, So all of these things are going on. I would think if I'm a soldier on the ground, I'm probably making things sound a little better than they really are uh, for the sake of my family so they don't worry as much. But then again, not everybody f would feel that way. And this is 100 years ago. So people's ideas and motivations are different. So I'm interested to hear what these letters are all about and what they have to say. Join me on the journey. Was a letter to a German newspaper in December of 1914. Yesterday, there was a fierce and terrible onslaught of Christmas packages into our trenches. No man was spared. In the confusion, one soldier suffered a salami impaled straight into his stomach. Another had raisins from an exploding pastry fly directly into his eyes. A third had the misfortune of having a bottle of cognac fly into his mouth. Is that real? That's awesome if so. This little holiday special is brought to you by World of Tanks. Use the invite code ARMISTICE if you're a new player who wants to check out the game. World War I was a letter-writing war, one where pencil and paper were a soldier's line of communication with friends and family, and reading those letters provides some insight into what life was like in those trenches. So today, let's read some excerpts from those soldiers' holiday letters. Now, of course, none of us at Extra Credits have ever experienced being deployed over the holidays, so real quick, I want to hand the mic over to somebody who has. Here is Wargaming's military specialist Richard Cutland back again to give us a little insight. In my 30 years of service, I was extremely fortunate to only spend around six Christmases away from home and family. The first was spent lying in a muddy ditch in Northern Ireland, where we had been ordered to set up an observation post to watch the comings and goings of a known IRA terrorist. Cold, wet, hungry and tired, watching someone else celebrate Christmas with family and friends. It was certainly a low point for us all. Hmm. As a young soldier, the easiest thing to do was not think about it. It was merely another day amongst a multitude of other days. The real heartbreak occurred after marriage and children. It was wrenching to explain why Daddy would not be there on such a special day. Tales of helping Santa at the North Pole or having to feed the reindeer quickly wore thin as my children grew older and wiser. A soldier's wife has much to contend with, and my own wife's angst and worry during any operational tour was compounded when I was away for the holidays. The armies always tried their best if circumstances allowed. If you were near a headquarters, the chefs would knock up a Christmas dinner with all the trimmings. Well, perhaps not all, but they did their best with what was available. Unfortunately, sitting with a hundred men wearing paper hats was not quite the same as Christmas dinner with your family. Yet we were all aware it's necessary to spend such periods away. And let's face it, it was part of the job. But it was always a killer to be told that a deployment was imminent and Christmas would be cancelled. So to all those servicemen and women who find themselves away for this very special time, I salute you. 
and wish you and your families peace and happiness. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that many of you guys watching are either in the military uh, or a former military or you're the family member of someone who's in the military and to all of you I say thank you and not just the members of the military who are deployed but all the families who sacrifice especially at the holidays because you have a family member deployed so thank you so much for what you do what you continue to do uh, and I hope that you were able to have an incredible Christmas thank you Richard now let's set the scene it's Boxing Day 1914, and Private Henry Williamson is writing home about the most extraordinary Christmas of his life. I'm writing from the trenches. In my mouth is a pipe presented by the Princess Mary. In the pipe is tobacco. Well, of course, you say. But wait, in the pipe is German tobacco from a German soldier. Yes, a live German soldier from his own trench. On Christmas Eve, both armies sang carols and cheered, and there was very little firing. The Germans called to our men to come and fetch a cigar, and our men told them to come to us. This went on... <laughs> so, come on out! No, 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 you come out! Uh, if you come out, I'll come out. You know, I mean, that had to have been tough, and, and we know that certain men who were the first to come out ended up getting shot until they figured this out. But, you know, there I've, I've actually read occasionally still people who try to argue that these Christmas truces didn't take place. And to you, I say that's absolutely ridiculous. We just have way too many uh, letters home from both sides, allies and um, central powers, writing about these things happening. Too many details uh, to ignore that this was something that was widespread. It was not something that was ordered from on high, but it was something that happened spontaneously all over the place in 1914 for some time until a bold Tommy crept out and stood between the trenches and a Saxon came to meet him. They shook hands and laughed. Thus the ice was broken. Our men are speaking to them now. German Corporal Joseph Wenzel was similarly amazed at the gathering, writing, What I believed to be madness several hours ago, I could see now with my own eyes, Bavarians and English. Until then, the greatest of enemies shook hands, talked, and exchanged items. A single star stood still in the sky directly above them, interpreted by many as a special sign from mm -hmm. heaven. More and more joined, and the entire line greeted each other. And you know, this is an important reminder. He said something about until, you know, that moment they had been enemies. And the nations are enemies uh, because of diplomacy, because of declarations of war, because of things that have gone wrong. Individuals are still people. That guy, you know, I've never been in combat, so I can't speak to this. And I understand that a certain part of you has to turn off the switch of understanding that the guy you're shooting at is a human being because it makes it harder to kill him. And so to a certain extent, you have to dehumanize him. You have to turn him into a caricature, into some enemy to be eliminated and not a real person who is a husband and a father or a son uh, who has a family back home who loves him, who had a job that he would love to be back at instead of out here on the trenches. Uh, but when it really comes down to it, that guy is not my enemy. He's just another guy trying to get home. For the rest of my life, I shall never forget this scene, which goes to show that human feelings continue to go on, even if, in these times, men do not know anything but killing and murdering. But not everybody held fire. British rifleman John Erskine's unit was fraternizing in no man's land when a soldier, disobeying his officer's order, shot one of the Germans. Mm. He writes, the Germans immediately replied, and instead of firing on where the shot came from, they fired at the first person they saw. Unfortunately, this happens to be one of our corporals who was shot through the head. A most regrettable fact connected with the affair was that he has three brothers in the battalion, and it must have had a disheartening effect on Ugh. them. The Germans apologized, but it left a black mark on the day. Still, in many places, the peace held, until the generals ended it with artillery. The spirit of the Christmas truce would be rekindled the following year, albeit on a small scale. In December of 1915, French soldier Louis Barthas found himself in a spontaneous ceasefire when heavy rain forced both sides to abandon their trenches. He wrote, Frenchmen and Germans looked at each other and saw that they were all men, no different from one another. Yep. They smiled, exchanged comments, hands reached out and grasped. We shared tobacco, a canteen of coffee, or panard. 
One day, a huge devil of a German stood up on a mound and gave a speech, which only the Germans could understand word for word, but everyone knew what it meant because he smashed his rifle on a tree stump, huh. breaking it in two. Applause broke out <coughs> on both sides. Meanwhile, our big shot leaders were in a furor. What in the Lord's name would happen if the soldiers refused to kill each other? Hmm. German soldier Ermann Bauer, also present, was thinking much the same. He wrote, the infantry does not shoot anymore, just the crazy artillery. The masters make war, they have a quarrel. And we talked about this uh, in the previous episode about this, and the link's in the description if you didn't catch that. But um, the, the motivation of the officers, they have a job to do, and I'm not criticizing them for that. Their job is to keep these guys fighting, keep their morale up, make sure that they're ready to do their jobs. And they're setting, um, you know, targets, and they're the ones that are uh, creating the, the strategies. And then they're expecting these men to carry them out. Well, if the men don't carry them out, what do you do? You can threaten to shoot them. You can court-martial them. You can punish them somehow. You can issue orders to the artillery to fire, even if the men on the front line won't. And we've talked a number of times about the studies that have been done that showed even in the best of situations, even when there is no Christmas truce where you actually fraternize with the enemy, most guys just don't shoot at one another on the front lines. The artillery... They don't have that same problem because an artillery guy that's a mile behind the line, he doesn't see what he's shooting at. He just has a target. He's told, this is the sector where you're supposed to fire, and he fires. So it's not really he's not really thinking about the fact that this shell's going to land on a father. This shell's going to land on a husband. This shell's going to land on the guy I just met. Uh, so it's a different story on the front line. So the officers, starting in 1915 with Christmas, they order these huge artillery barrages to try and prevent these things from happening again. And the workers, the little men, have to stand there fighting against each other. Is that not a great stupidity? Once again, senior officers broke the truce with artillery and court-martial threats. The fighting began again, and Barthas would spend three more Christmases at war. The same was true for many others. In fact, Christmas of 1916 brought Canadian infantryman John McLean his first taste of combat. He wrote, Dear Mother, I haven't written for over a week now, but I couldn't very well. We went into the trenches on Christmas Eve and were in for six days. It and you know, by 1916, on the Western Front, I mean, we're talking about the aftermath of two of the bloodiest battles in history, the Somme and Verdun. Uh, you know, by this point, we're talking millions of dead and wounded across these front lines. This had to have been the most miserable Christmas yet. It was not too bad at all. Far better than I expected. All our fellows came out fine, except Jack Ivner, who got a machine gun bullet through the leg. Hmm. The noise was awful, but a person will get used to that after a while. I spent Christmas Day in a dugout. If I live to be 300 years old, I will never forget this Christmas week. One night, I was going up a trench, and I saw a big gray cat sitting on the parapet. I'd like to tell you more, but I can do that when I get home. Now you are doing too much worrying. We are all right if a See, that's what I was talking about. A lot of times these guys are motivated in their letters by... What can I say without causing them to worry too much? So they're going to tone down how bad things are. They're not going to necessarily talk about just how awful their experience is because they don't want to add to the worry of their families back home. Man is careful. A month later, he was dead. Meanwhile, another Canadian, Jack Davy, was having a bittersweet Christmas. He had come home after months in a POW camp, only to find himself at a military hospital in Toronto, thousands of miles from his new fiancée. He wrote to her on Boxing Day. Darling Kitty, many thanks for the letter and the card with Christmas wishes. We had quite a snowstorm on Christmas Eve. It's quite a novelty to see a real white Christmas. Yesterday was a lovely day. On the whole, I had a good time, but I hope next year won't be such a disappointment for us, sweetheart. Surely this rotten luck of being separated at Christmas can't go on forever. One week has passed since I was measured for my leg. I wish mm. that I could have it by the new year so I could start the year on both feet again. It will soon be two years since I walked like a human being. Wow. It seems a long time to talk about it, but I can picture those fields and imagine I can see the exact spot where I fell, as though it only happened yesterday. I guess it'll be a long day before I forget it. But I hope that all the dark days are behind us now, sweetheart. We just have to be happy and live long to make up for it all. As the war ended and the veterans trickled home, that is exactly what they tried to do. Yet their holidays spent in the shadow of dugouts would never fully leave them. There are so many letters like these. Honestly, deciding which ones to include was the hardest part. Mm. 
But if this happened to capture your imagination, try something later. If you go home for the holidays, or if you happen to already be there, ask your relatives if they have any old letters lying around. It's possible that the next story from the trenches might come from your own family. Hmm. Happy holidays, everybody. We'll see you next year. So if you have any particular individual person's story from the Western Front of World War I, in particular... Um, the southern part of the Western Front. So I'm talking about the Somme, Verdun, uh, Mousargon, Belleau Wood, Chateau Thierry, places like that. Those are the places I'm planning to be in a month. I would love to hear those stories. Send me a link, send me a digital copy, something. I would love to feature some of those individual soldiers' stories in my videos that I'm working on. Uh, I'm already planning what videos I'm going to shoot uh, from the Western Front when I go. Uh, so let me know those. Use the comment section below. Send me an email, vloggingthroughhistory at gmail.com. I would love to hear those. Uh, a bunch of original content coming your way in the next week or so. So be watching for those things. And uh, we'll see you soon uh, for a new year. Thanks for watching.